Amma Bar. In my last talk, I said that Islam is a complete way of life. It has got laws which govern every walk of life and every aspect of human existence. Let us take an example, a practical one, to study the types of philosophy and the types of inclinations human beings have developed over the years. Someday, if you were to come with me to India, you might come across certain hermits who have left everything, renounced the world, as they say, and come to live under the mountains or at the feet of Himalayas. There, despite all the inclemency and unkindness of the weather, you'll find one hermit sitting at the feet of the mountain, either with his hand raised or with his one foot, one leg raised, and deep in meditation. Naturally, he's there for the last several years. He believes that he's trying to liaise with God. He's trying to develop a bond, a spiritual bond with his creator. He's trying to understand the true meaning of happiness and satisfaction. He's trying to tell the world, in other words, most silently, that everything mundane is useless and therefore must be discarded. All that he had, all his possessions and belongings, he has sacrificed for the sake of this sort of existence. With his beards overgrown and hair overgrown, sometimes nails overgrown, we find these people living with bare minimum of life, sometimes deprived of even the most essential needs. But this is of their own choice. Such a man is a man who can tell us that he does no one any harm, he does not backbite, he does not cheat or deceive, he does not quarrel, he is a nice man. Well, after all, when we describe a pious person or a righteous person or a noble man, we always attribute such qualities to him or her, saying that he does not commit these vices. No cheating, no stealing, no backbiting, no quarreling, no deceiving, no lying, and things like that. As opposed to this, there's another man who is in the society, has a family, has raised a family, has got children, has friends, is involved in some business, but at the same time, he does not cheat, does not deceive, does not harm anyone, does not trample upon anybody's feet. He is also a person with noble qualities and noble traits. Now, what is the difference between these two? Are we going to regard both of them in the same way? I give an example and I give this quite often. I say, if I were to tell you that I have for the last 40 years not committed even a single traffic offense, most of the friends would immediately jump to their feet and say, brother, it seems that you have some magic with you, some divine word or implement, taviz or amulet. Can you give it to us so that we may tie it to our steering rod and we may not commit any offense. And in reply, if I were to tell them that I have not committed any traffic offense simply because I do not know how to drive, you'll be shocked. Because the immediate answer would be that, brother, if you never drove, if you do not know how to drive, if you have never sat behind the wheel in a car to drive, then to say that you have committed no offense is no achievement. So you better take some driving lessons, obtain driving license, sit in the car and drive and come to the road. 
And then if you for the last 40 or 50 or for the coming years do not commit any offense and if you take pride in it, it could be considered as an achievement that you have really driven very carefully, sensibly and safely. So the difference between these two is that one at the feet of the mountain away from society is pious. And here there is a man who is in the society, in the mainstream of the society, he is also pious and righteous. The difference between these two is that the one is right in it, where all sorts of distractions were possible, he has tried to save himself and has saved himself. While the other gentleman has remained away, where there are no distractions, there is no achievement. In other words, in Islam, there is no concept of negative goodness. The concept in Islam is of positive nobility. And this is the reason why Islam tells us not to renounce the world. Islam tells us to live in this world. It tells us to marry and raise a family. The Prophet wasallam had a family. He had wives and children. And he was a businessman once upon a time. And as he got involved in the divine mission by the command of Allah, he became a statesman where in Medina, an Islamic state was formed and he was there as a ruler. So, after having involved himself in the mainstream of the society, then he led a life which was exemplary and set the laws for Muslims to lead a life to lead an exemplary life, life of virtue, not by disassociating oneself, not by detachment, not by disconnection, but actually by living with the people and show by conduct, practical way of leading a life which is Islamic, which is pure, and which is also unsullied by all those vices. Having understood this, how has Islam managed to achieve it? We shall deal with some of the aspects in this lesson. The first thing is that Islam has laid down laws. But before the laws were laid, the principles or the roots of religion were introduced. Islam is based on three major roots, which are called one, unity of God, Tawheed. The second route, which is a major route, is the prophethood of the prophets who were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third is the day of judgment or qiyamah, where every person, male or female, man or woman, shall rise to give account for his or her deeds. The day of resurrection, the day of rising again after having died. These are the three major roots or principles or fundamentals of Islam upon which is, are based the laws of Islam. And the Prophet wasallam achieved what he wanted to achieve after having laid these three major foundations. Now, it's true that there are other foundations also which we can discuss later on. I'm discussing the commonly accepted three fundamentals. When I say commonly accepted, I mean all the Muslims, irrespective of the denominations they belong to, irrespective and regardless of the sectarian differences they might have, agree that these are the three fundamentals. The first concept is of absolute unity of God. The Quran declares, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid, Walam Yulad, Walam Yakullahu Kufuan Ahad. Say, O Prophet, unto this people that He, Allah, is absolute unity. Allahu Samad, He, Allah, is self sufficient. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He neither begets nor is begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kufuan ahad. 
and he has no match. There can be no comparison with him. This absolute negation of any dichotomy, of any duality or dualism, of any thought of any sort of association with Godhead, today remains the special mark of Islam. Many religions may say that we believe in one God. We know of those religions. They all claim that we all believe in only one God, only one creator. But in that hierarchy of Godheads, we find smaller gods, sometimes written with small g, appearing here and there, while in Islam, total negation of all and confirmation and affirmation of only one creator remains the landmark of Islam even today. There is no God but God. So therefore, when anyone wants to become a Muslim, we don't have any other ceremonies like taking him for a baptism or taking him to immerse him in water or making him wear a particular type of clothes or adopting a particular type of fashion. No. The only thing is this, that if he is convinced and there is no force, no oppression, no cajoling, it's a simple thing if he is convinced, if he finds that this is the religion which he can adopt and which he should, then he has only got to say, the formula is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Once having said this formula, after having understood, a man enters the fold of Islam because the principal factor is to accept unity of God. Allah is a word in Islam which is used for God. And it is a word which has been translated as God. Unfortunately, there is no other satisfactory translation of this word in any other language. Because in English, for example, we do find God being used sometimes with capital G and sometimes with small, sometimes as male and sometimes as female. For example, we do have goddesses and gods and all sorts of words used in English language. Allah, in English also, they sometimes even put plural gods. But in Allah, there is no plurality. That word in Arabic language cannot be pluralized. There is no duality for it. There is no gender in it. Therefore, the word is something singular. But at the same time, for people to understand, any name may be given to that existence which in Islam is one and absolute unity. Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Say, O oh Muhammad, that Allah, He is absolute unity. I have translated it as absolute unity because though the word is used, ahad, but if we ponder deep over that word, we may come to understand that there was some meaning attributed to it. Because there is another word in Arabic which also means one, which is wahid. It could have been قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ وَاحِدْ But the difference between wahid and ahad in the Arabic usage is that wahid meaning one can be preceded by zero or less than one or can be followed subsequently by some fractions added to one or two or three or four and then, of course, indefinite numbers, infinite series of numbers. While here, Ahad does not have anything to precede, does not have anything to follow. It means absolute unity, which is not divisible, not reducible, and nothing can be added to it. And that must be understood, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most high, is an existence which does not have any body, it is not corporeal, it does not have any body, does not have any shape, he is everywhere, is not confined in any limit. You cannot just say there he is or he is not there, he is everywhere. 
He is within and without. He is my creator. When he's away from me, he is not away to say that he is detached. When he is with me, he is not with me to say that he is a part of me. That is the philosophy of Islam about oneness of God. By saying this, the prophet of Islam revolutionized the whole society. Ostensibly and apparently it looks like to be a formula. La ilaha illallah is just one another formula? No. In the society to which Islam was first preached, the Arab society, there were so many social laws which divided men and men based on classes. There were high and low people. There were people who could not set their eyes on the face of their masters because they were slaves. Women were treated like chattels. Men were supposed to be the only human being. There was a time when poor did not dare talk to the rich. When people were divided into tribes, each tribe claiming superiority over the other. We had all sorts of problems then. And there when the Prophet said, Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Say there is no God but Allah. God. You shall be saved. What happened? Immediately. All the Godheads, in the form of class distinctions, in the form of discrimination, in the form of this being high and that being low, this being master and this being slave, man and woman, all those unnecessary discriminations and distinctions which came as deities and Godheads were demolished once and for all. For the first time a man could stand next to his brother regardless of his standing politically or his status by way of wealth, could stand next to him and say, both of us are creation of one God. By unifying them in Tawheed, Islam created harmony and brotherhood which was unprecedented and remains matchless even today. In the mosques of Islam, you can see time and again for yourselves a man black in complexion or white brown in complexion or yellow, high and low, tall and short, of all denominations, of all nationalities of the world, as they say, you find them standing shoulder to shoulder, praying before one Allah, in the way he has ordained. This perhaps you might not find in any other religion. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.